Hi, this is Sean Perrin, and you're listening to episode 64 of the Clarinet Podcast, the show where I discuss all that's new and neat with clarinet with the neatest people in the industry. Today's episode of the podcast, I speak with Jerome Bunke, who is the producer of Stanley Drucker's five CD release called The Heritage Collection, which was the feature of last episode. Jerome is a highly accomplished clarinetist and producer, and we discuss elements of his career as a performer, what it means to produce music, the importance of performing contemporary repertoire, and we have some rather surprising and interesting conversation about digital music formats versus traditional vinyl that you won't want to miss. Recently, the so-called lightning round portion of the interview has been exclusively available to gold-level Patreon sponsors, but I felt that Jerome's comments were so insightful that everyone should really get the chance to hear them. So consider today's bonus lightning round as a special treat, but also a reminder of the extra bonus content that's available exclusively to Patreon supporters of the show. If you feel you are enjoying the podcast and you get value from it on an ongoing basis, please consider supporting its ongoing production at www.clarinet.com and click on the Patreon link. Today, I'd like to thank Patreon backers Gregory C., Garrett M., and JDS. If you're listening to this episode on August 18th, 2017, I'd like to remind you that today is the very last chance to take advantage of the special offer extended to Clarinet listeners to obtain a signed copy of Stanley Drucker's Heritage Collection. To purchase, head to digitalforce.com slash Clarinet. Of course, I'll be putting this link and all other relevant links in the show notes for today's episode, which you can find at Clarinet.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy today's conversation with Jerome Bunke. We'll dive right in, right after a short message from our sponsor, Daddario Woodwinds. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, Daddario is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques. So you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from Daddario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com woodwinds. So how did you first encounter Stanley Drucker? I first met Stanley when uh, I was uh, in junior high school in, in Albany, New York. I grew up around Albany, New York, the, the capital of New York State, in uh, places such as Slingerlands, uh, which uh, is slightly to the southwest of, of, of Albany. There was uh, a pianist uh, in town, Miriam Brickman, who, uh, and it uh, turns out that her family and, and, and our family were, were friends. And uh, she knew Stanley, and, and, uh, and Stanley and Naomi were doing a concert with her and, in Albany, and uh, it was, that's how I met him. And he was the one who then, uh, I was already playing clarinet at the time, and, uh, and he introduced me to Leon. Mm-hmm. Rushinoff. And, yes, Leon Rushinoff. And at that point, what I started to do was to take week, weekend bus trips into New York, up and back on the same day to have lessons with, with Leon Rushinoff. Wow. And, uh, and, and that was, was done, you know, that introduction was made by Stanley. And, um, you know, both of them were very, very keen um, influences in, in, you know, in my career. Um, uh, Leon... Uh, uh, at that point, was just teaching at, at the Manhattan School of Music, and uh, I uh, was accepted uh, with a scholarship to, to go to Juilliard, and uh, Leon encouraged me to do that with the understanding that he was always there as a safety net, and Stanley uh, was always uh, very encouraging, uh, 
Matter of fact, Stanley would go to a lot of my my recitals and concerts, and uh, my uh, people at uh, Juilliard were actually very very pleased and proud that uh, that uh, they didn't view Stanley as a quote unquote competitor a competitor for teaching, but actually took it as as uh, as, as a sign of of, uh, of interest that that, that he would be. Uh, you know, coming to my concerts and uh, and you know I, I went a lot to his rehearsals. I learned an awful lot from Stanley just by observing. Uh, I turned pages at, at a lot of his concerts, at his recording sessions, uh, the Nielsen Concerto that he did with uh, Leonard Bernstein in the New York Philharmonic. I was at all the rehearsals, all the performances, wow. and it was it was just an invaluable, invaluable uh, learning experience to to be so close to him so often. We did, uh, was also uh, Stanley, I believe, uh, has, has spoken uh, quite often about Hans Meinig from Philadelphia, and Stanley would make uh, trips down to see him to have his clarinet worked on, and, and, and often I would go down with him, and, and actually some of my clarinets uh, came, came from, from, from Hans also. You yourself became a champion of new music through your performance career, um, and would you say that the direction that you went in this regard, you mentioned kind of feeling as if um, the position that you would have in the city for the orchestra was almost taken. You just didn't know it would be taken for so long. But do you think that this has kind of led to your, your sort of desire to look at the music that, that was up and coming in the, the, um, the scene at the time and, and try to promote it? A visual artist has direct access to, to the audience. Yes. Uh, one can see it in a museum. You can also see it reproduced in, in magazines or newspapers, you know, and get very broad c coverage. Um, you know, music is, exists in time, Sean. Yes. And therefore, if no one is going to perform that music, then the audience doesn't hear it. So I really felt that being able to integrate um, contemporary music, music of our time, with other programming, you know, was something that was really going to be very, very important to me and, and also, of course, uh, became uh, an area of specialty for me. Uh, among them were not only having composers such as, uh, you know, Ro Robert Starr, uh, Richard Lean, uh, you know, composed pieces for me. Uh, I also uh, did the Carnegie Hall premiere of the Missian Quartet for the End of Time. Yes, so, I just want to ask you about this. One of my favorite pieces. You know, so a lot of times, um, being able to even uh, perform, I don't want to say neglected works, but maybe works that needed more, had more of a spotlight shown on them was also a very important thing. Uh, uh, I know that uh, in, I was able to perform and, and tour in Japan and and, and it's where I introduced the Bernstein Sonata, the, the Sonatina by Martineau, um, as well as uh, contemporary American works uh, by, by Elliot Schwartz, uh, among, among others. So many clarinetists um, almost relish in the past, and I don't want to say they forget about the new works, but I do feel like some of them sometimes do. Um, do you? How do you see as far as when you plan to program these sort of albums? I mean, are you trying to incorporate and blend the, the pieces together, or are you trying to pick only new works, or how do you look at it And as a, as a clarinetist? Well, I think that what I do believe in is, it's like saying one likes to read literature, but you only read literature by one author. Yeah. So quite often I see these entirely as, um, as what makes sense from a programming from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. that, that the pieces build on one another, that you're going to lead, let's say, to the intermission, what you do after the intermission, to the end of the, end of the, of the, of the, of the stated concert. Uh, uh, what might you have in your back pocket, uh, knowing that the, there will hopefully be an encore. Uh, but I think that giving an overall sense to the beginning, middle, end is very important. It's one of the things which I've not only brought to my own performances, but also as a producer. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things, for example, about uh, Stanley Drucker's uh, five CD heritage collection is that I looked at every single CD in the collection as if it were a program, 
Mm. You know, that there was some continuity, as well as the fact that we also really included a tremendous amount of contemporary music. Yes. Yeah. Within the, within the, within the scope of that. And again, part of this is to balance it out. I really appreciate that, actually, because it, I, I imagine there would have been a temptation with this collection, especially to sort of just go in chromatic, sorry, <laughs> chromatic, chronological, <laughs> <laughs> chronological order through the pieces or to list them alphabetically or something sort of dry like that. But I think the effort and attention paid to sort of make almost complete recitals on each album was really, really, it had great foresight, fantastic idea and artistically very fulfilling, I would say, upon, as a listener. Well, well, th well, thank you. It, it's sort of like, uh, remember, I had a basketball coach who asked us to line up uh, alphabetically by height, um, <laughs> you know, so uh, so that you do want it to have that arch. And uh, in matter of fact, there were some other uh, programs uh, that went into the, uh, when I produced uh, uh, some of Stanley's uh, re recordings, which I did for uh, the Laureate series. And those also included a tremendous amount of contemporary work because that really is the idiom that we're growing up in. And it is interesting to see how all of this has, has, has changed. Um, we are today, uh, the definitions of what is contemporary music has, has blurred. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there are as many silos as to what pieces now include jazz or include uh, other, other elements of, of today's vernacular. So the vocabulary keeps expanding. Well, it makes sense for the contemporary music to shift because there's always a new kind of contemporary, you know? I mean, we're now living in a different era than, than when a lot of these pieces were first composed. And it makes me wonder which ones will, as you say, kind of stand the test of time and, and, and in history when we look back. Um, but one thing's true is that the works we remember will be because of people like you who performed them and brought them to life. We can't remember works that we didn't hear. <laughs> very, very true. You know? Thank you. Yes. So I wanted to ask one thing because you're the first person I've had on the podcast and uh, who's kind of in a been, who's been in a producer role um, and you very extensively, obviously. Um, it, but just for listeners, because some people I imagine they're not actually quite sure what a, it is a producer does, especially those who are newer to the recording. I remember when I did my first CD last year, and I, I was planning the whole thing. I knew I had my myself, obviously, the marimbist. I was going to hire a studio. I wasn't quite sure where a producer fits in, but after having done it, it was undoubtedly a great decision to include a producer. So <laughs> <laughs> would you walk me through kind of what it is that your role is um, when you do produce CDs or, or music or concerts and these kind of things and, and why it's such a valuable part of the musical... Um, recording experience? Well, there, there's also various um, roles that producers um, play, whether or not they're independent producers or whether or not they're actually specifically already working for a label. Mm -hmm. Because at that point, you're really determining the repertoire, what is going on with the person's career. Um, also, uh, does it have to do with what pieces are in somebody's repertoire and are you adding pieces to the repertoire? Um, for this, but your producer basically is the one who behind the scenes is making it all happen. So it has to do from, from working on what the repertoire will be, who are the performers going to be, um, what is going to be the venue for recording it, um, are they going to be uh, you know, live recordings uh, from various days. Uh, this happens in orchestras a lot where um, an orchestra may play the same concert four or five times, and then from that you'll cull performances. One of the unique things about uh, uh, Stanley Drucker's <clears throat> you know, heritage collection is that these were quote-unquote one-take live concerts. Mm -hmm. You know, they weren't necessarily, um, you know, performed with the idea that they would be recording, so that, that's why they come from a various venue. So in, our, in the situation of, as being producer there, I think there were a lot of archival and historic um, um, considerations that had to be. Uh, there had to be situations of what uh, extraneous noises could be edited out without impacting on the overall uh, premise, which was to have a live recording and all the excitement that it has, and especially a performer such as Stanley, who was so spontaneous. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, his uh, performances, uh, are, are unique every single time he plays it. Uh, there was a very um, 
uh, Arnold Steinhardt, the violinist from the, uh, uh, you know, he, from the Guarneri Quartet, mentioned about a concert that Stanley did with, with them. And they had rehearsals that were wonderful. And when it came time for the concert, it was different. Not that it was any less wonderful, any less magnificent, but it was different. It wasn't necessarily something that was, because the rehearsal went one way, the performance was etched in stone, it wasn't going to vary. Mm -hmm. It did vary. Yeah. And afterwards, uh, our Arnold Starnhart was, was speaking with Stanley, and he said, well, gee, you know, boy, what an experience. It was great. We had to be on our toes. Things, you know, you know what, what happened? You know, what were the rehearsals? He was trying to compare the rehearsals to the actual performance. And Stanley said, well, you know, the rehearsals were for the audience, but the performance was for you. I like that. Meaning the quartet. You know, that it was going to keep it spontaneous. And, and, and it had nothing to do with whether or not one interpretation was more valid, but we all feel differently day to day. We notice this when, uh, when we're, we're, we're an athlete. You know, why a baseball pitcher one day the curveball is working, the next day it isn't, and he has to go to something else in, 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 in the pitch selection. In the studio, how do you work to maintain spontaneity if, if, the, uh, if the performance is not a live concert? A great deal of psychology. Uh, sometimes it's um, recording things a little bit out of order. Mm. Um, <clears throat> Can you expand on that? That's interesting insight. Um, like, do you mean within a piece, like recording sections out of order, or the movements out of order, or no? The whole it, program? May, it, may, it may be it may be pieces. It may be. Um, it may be the idea of what it is to get all the balances and everything set up. And sometimes, for example, uh, I'll go back and, and do a, a slow movement uh, later in the session. Mm -hmm. Maybe when things have calmed down and maybe a lot of the nervous energy has dissipated. Do you believe in the magic you know, of the first take? Um, Not, not always, <laughs> not always, uh, because sometimes some people uh, do better on the second. It's also knowing the performers, what, 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 yeah. what, what they, what they can do. Uh, the um, uh, sometimes the second take after they hear a little feedback says, okay, this is how it's going, um, how it's getting set up. And even when you, I'm sure, are interviewing uh, various people for your podcasts, uh, you're not ready to go right away. Uh, Maybe there might be some microphone interference or something, <laughs> something uh, that, that has to get straightened out first. And, and yeah. uh, a lot of times that, that happens. I will say as far as first take, I once had uh, a very uh, fantastic experience as a producer doing something with Marvin Hamlish and Leonard Slacken uh, in, involving when, uh, when, when the late Marvin Hamlish was the conductor of the, of the Pops in Washington. Hmm. And um, that was definitely a situation where everything that Marvin Hamlish did was witty, bright on top of it, and his first take was always the best. Hmm. Always. He, he was so, so extemporaneous. That's so crazy. extemporaneous, his first take was always the best. So do you enjoy, um, well, I, 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 of course you enjoy the studio, but what I'm trying to ask is, do you prefer the live venue as far as for spontaneity or the studio for the fact that you can polish? Great, great, great question. I think there's room for both of them. Because famously, Glenn Gould, for example, um, was, he became quite timid of the concert stage, um, which was rather strange because later in career, he would start to conduct orchestras in a live setting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. so it was a little bit odd, but, but he famously really preferred the chance to kind of iron out the per imperfections in that may happen. He, he thought of them as imperfections. Other people would think of them as spontaneous, wonderful moments, but, <laughs> right. but, um, yeah. So you're comfortable in either domain. You prefer yes. both. Very interesting. I, I, I really, I really do. And I think what I do prefer a lot though, is making sure that if we're using a studio situation, uh, that it is something where there are some naturally live acoustics, mm. which, uh, I mean, I noticed this from my uh, travels performing or, or you know, when, when I performed in, in, in the UK and in England, a lot of the venues were in churches. In other words, um, both in uh, England, Japan, and other places, the, there wasn't enough land. The country wasn't big enough to have separate concert halls. Hmm. You know, the, the concert halls should be a separate 
edifice that you go to. Um, so that um, a lot of your, your English fruit recording walls, uh, being in, in churches, just had like a lot of wood, a lot of natural acoustics. Um, uh, Columbia, for a long time, had a, here in New York City, had a, an old Armenian church on East 30th Street. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and uh, you know, Horowitz recorded there. Uh, the West Side Story was recorded there. And Miles Davis, Dave Brubeck, Vladimir Horowitz. It, it was wow. a phenomenal space. When you're recording, um, do you feel like, or producing, do you put on a different sort of hat for the producer than for when you're performing? Or do you kind of see them as extensions of the same thing? Or maybe another way to word that is, do you feel that the performing aspect of music intertwines with the producing aspect and allows you to see a more broad kind of perspective? Um, fascinating uh, point that you make there, because I think the fact that I do both is really important because I do have an awful lot of empathy for what the performer is going through and what can you ask and, and what can you try to get to understand. At the same time, they understand that I've been there, mm -hmm. that, that I know what it's, what it's also like, and therefore here are some suggestions that may help or if you thought about this. And uh, you know, sometimes it's making sure that, uh, that there's enough going on where you can then you know, be you know, frivolous and, and, and try to you know, create a more relaxed atmosphere and, and go for you know, one last tape or something like that. Uh, you certainly don't want to be at the point where you're asking for something that just physically isn't going to be there. Uh, and all you are is making it harder to get more great music at the end. The most important thing is you really want excellence. Yeah, you want to provide a setting so that people can soar. You want everybody, you want to do everything you can to make sure that, the, that what comes out is to the highest standards, the best of the person's ability. And you have to create that atmosphere, create a team who have that expertise that understand what the artist is trying for, what's going to make their performance and their recording great. It's just like, gee, are we eavesdropping, you know, while, while this great interpretation is going on. Do you ever have issues or have you encountered issues with artists who maybe aren't as comfortable with the recording element as you? I mean, I consider some of the conversations on this podcast I found very interesting, actually, specifically with Harry Sparnai and Laurie Friedman. Both of them really prefer live setting concerts and to go do a studio album for them is almost like a, it's almost, what's the word? Like, <laughs> it's just like a necessity, you know? So how do you bring a performance from that type of person to life or inspire them to do the best while they're there, even if they maybe prefer a live concert setting? Um, Have you encountered that? Not, not very often uh, because usually people Especially today, um, are, are you? Are you? It's more part of, of their vocabulary. I think you're right. Uh, yeah. So, for example, someone like um, I was just mentioning Harry Sparnai. The reason I bring him up is because I, I recall that he also likes to champion new music. Obviously, I mean, he kind of brought the bass clarinetist to, to pro, sorry the bass clarinet to prominence. If you if you think about it that way, but. Um, I think he sort of viewed, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think he viewed recording almost as a necessary evil to do that, you know, because he was quoted on the podcast even saying that his favorite moment was when the little light would go off and he could go home. <laughs> 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 I asked him what his favorite moment in the studio was, having been on over 60 records or something, and that's what he said. So, Oh, gosh. <laughs> very wow. interesting, man. And I found and, that and, to be yeah. very strange. See, and yet... And yet See, maybe again because of one's experience, and and, uh, and maybe because I, I've spent so much time in, in in the New York City area, and uh, if you want to say the New York scene, um, recording is also in so many ways part of the creative process. Yes, uh, I've I've done many. Um, gosh, uh, I mean, I've worked with Elmer Bernstein, Don Sebevsky, uh, uh, you know, very very well known arrangers, and. You know, on the fly, something has to be changed. Something, you know, doesn't quite fit. Something could be a couple of seconds off with the video, whatever might be going on. And you're part of that process. So you're creating something. It necessarily isn't um, so, something which uh, is not a positive thing by doing, but by recording. No, I agree. I think that the album or the, 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 
the studio version of something is has a great importance as, as far as a performance piece. Um, and uh, you know, I've I've often thought I've often thought about having people come into the studio just to cough. <laughs> just to cut really to insert them into. I mean, there are. I mean, how many right. slow movements are there where there's the <laughs> obligatory cough in the slow movement? You yeah, know, just before the most beautiful moment. Right. You know. So so therefore, it helps make it authentic. But <laughs> but 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 another thing that way is, is Frank Sinatra. Um, uh, quite often in his recording sessions, he would have a select invited audience there in his sessions. It would you know obviously there'd be family friends you know, friends of friends, but, you know, he might have, you know, might have had 20 or 30 people around to try to create that atmosphere. Yeah. That's what Lori Friedman said she would do. She would invite to, to get around her trepidation about recording. She would invite an audience to the studio mm-hmm. and turn it into a concert. Um, do you think that artists of this generation, given the fact that they can produce such polished, you know, you might say perfect um, versions of their performances in the studio, do you think that when they now perform live, there is additional pressure on them to, pr- to reproduce those kind of versions or that it gives them sort of a freedom to, to perform with more spontaneity with the idea that they've already got the perfect version kind of in the can? Usually it works the other way around. Usually the concerts take place before the recording. A lot of this also has to do with economic considerations. Mm-hmm. We are, in essence, your out-of-town concerts, you know, become the rehearsals for the recording. And then what you're trying to do at that point is to recapture and reproduce that. I think another thing too, which is part of this, has to do with um, how often people are able to record. Uh, recording is something that was a, took place in an early part of my career. A lot of this had to do with being part of contemporary music workshops where everything you did, even if you were sight reading, was recorded because that helped the composer. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, things such as the Bennington uh, Composers Conference and other areas like that. Um, uh, uh, I did a TV, I had a TV series uh, dealing with contemporary music, and one of the pieces um, uh, had um, that I commissioned actually called for the clarinet to do um, you know, musical episodes inside the, the piano. <laughs> so that we got the piano, you know, so we got the strings to resonate, and 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 we also created a visual element, so that if there was a need for the music, uh, a social need for the music, the music was created for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I, I think it I think it really goes you know hand in hand. How different is this if somebody is performing a concert and you know that there's a mic hanging and that the concert's being recorded? Yeah. Fair enough. I suppose I should rephrase it one last time. And what I was really trying to get at was once it's set in stone, um, do you feel that artists have the obligation or that they feel the obligation to reproduce that performance for audiences? And no. No. Okay. I don't. No, because I, th- cause I think each day and each audience is different. Yeah. And I think perf- as performers, we do that. I know that one of the things that... Uh, has also made me feel good about my performances is that so many of the reviews, no matter where they were from, really displayed the passion I have for, for my performances, the passion I have for music, how that's communicated to the audience. Um, I, I would always feel very at ease to, to speak with the audience uh, about pieces or about what was, about what was going on. Um, so uh, I never saw that as, as being where um, where, because the audience really mattered. You know, it's like being uh, in a sports analogy where you're you're playing it on the home court. Mm-hmm. You know, and you know the fans are behind you, and it's a real important thing. In other words, to uh, when I'm performing about having eye contact and knowing that 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 I'm playing to certain people and therefore to the whole audience around around them. But do you not feel like that in the studio too, in a way? I mean, you're just playing to them at a later time. You mentioned music is kind of about time. And I mean, one interesting thing to me about studio albums or performances is that the audience is there. They're just not there yet. <laughs> or they will, be, <laughs> they will be there one day. <laughs> right. But they'll, yeah. they'll most often be alone. It will be much more intimate as well. Right. Now that, that, that part I understand, but I think it's during the creating of it. Mm-hmm. Um, when, you, when you record, I mean, do you think of whom you might be playing for? 
Do you, do you pretend that there's a, a person there? It would be a little stranger, right? <laughs> <laughs> It would be odd. Yeah, it would be an odd thing. I, I No, I didn't. When I was recording my CD, for example, I I didn't consider them directly. I mean, especially not like in person, you know, to, to imagine there's someone watching me. That would be, you're right, it's it's a little odd. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's some really fascinating insight into all that. Um, what, One last question about that. I'm just, I'm just interested to know. Do you think that someone like Glenn Gould or even the Beatles who kind of turned into studio recluse, type people. Do you think that's possible today or do artists have to be more, more well-rounded in this generation as far as live and studio? I don't think that they necessarily make a conscious decision to do that. I think that it has really happened because of the evolution of different means of communication, of what um, artists are exposed to. It is very easy these days to find a person who could be um, in a jazz setting and then turn around and, and be performing with an orchestra. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think those lines are a lot, uh, are much more blurred uh, today where it's more more of one entity. Um, I'm trying to, uh, it, where um, it, it, I don't think that, I think the regimen has been a lot different. Uh, uh, I mean, we're now finding the jazz programs and music conservatories when a generation ago that wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, uh, you have somebody like, uh, like uh, Marcellus who uh, you know, has, uh, you know, can, can record uh, you know, music of, of, of Bach and, and also uh, you know, have, have uh, the jazz at Lincoln Center program. Yeah, such versatility. Yeah. And I, I think I think what uh, what I'd also like to see more of, or more of conductors have that, mm. you know, where they can be called more more visionaries and try to expand, uh, you know, you know their outreach. And then a lot of this also involves, um, you know, perhaps the multimedia and multidiscipline um, areas. In other words, one of the more popular programs in the New York Philharmonic recently has been to show a film and actually have the orchestra to, you know, play, play the movie score. That's been happening here too. I think it's a really cool thing, especially for exposing new audiences to the orchestra. How does the and orchestra I, feel about it there? What and I they? think, I also think that one of the issues is also what's happening to the whole um, state of music education. Mm -hmm. You know, and that is one of the things where it, it's not as prevalent as it used to be. There used to be school programs starting much earlier. It doesn't seem to be the case anymore. It's obviously one of the things where there've been a lot of cuts. So uh, I know that uh, there was a time in my career when I was involved with our National Endowment for the Arts. I was actually head of the uh, chamber music, some of our chamber music panels, and it was really important to make sure that we were able to get funding in different parts of the country, mm -hmm. the United States, so that these programs you know, would, would continue. In what way do you see um, things going in the next 5, 10, 20 years in this regard, getting better or worse? Well, I think it's been, um, and maybe even this, this uh, our conversation in, in a way is part of that, where you again have different means of changing communication. If there's a change in communication, there's going to be a change in which the art reaches the people. And we are here, there's going to be a change in the audience. Yeah. So I think a lot of these things have become too individual. One of the, it's like, um, oh, I don't know, did you see the movie La La Land? La La Land? No. Yeah, by Sorry. any chance. Uh, but the opening couple of minutes is a phenomenal, phenomenal widescreen dance set on you know Los Angeles freeway in a traffic jam. Uh, and uh, I was mentioning just how mesmerized by it. It was like such a great opening scene. And and a person said, well, gee, you know, I'll, I'll wait and I'll wait till I can download it and see it on my computer. And I'm saying, this should be seen on something that's 40 feet wide. Yeah. You know, a big screen. And, you know, so, and then you also have the whole idea of the shared, even in the theater, the shared audience experience. And this is something which I think, um, 
as you see more people go around wearing their earbuds yeah. and listening to things, you know, are we losing what it is to be part of, of the, the third dimension that happens with a live performance? You know, you have the performer, their music, but then you have also the audience reaction. And that's what really makes it special. You raise a really interesting point, actually. And it's, it's funny because this idea of listening to music by oneself or even podcasts or whatever, <laughs> just sitting there with, with the earbuds in was so weird that at first that back when Sony first released the Walkman, they included two headphone ports because they couldn't imagine people would sit there by themselves listening to oh. <laughs> to music. And but but here we are, you know, um, <laughs> it's such a strange, strange thing. Do you think in a way that the resurgence of vinyl is is almost a like a pushback against that? It's something people sit and listen to together and they have a physical contact with the art as a medium and. Well, I think the physical contact with the art is the medium is part of it. I think it's very much a, uh, a part of, if you want to say, the, the Whole Foods generation. Mm -hmm. You know, of people where the tactile thing is very, you know, uh, very important. Um, matter of fact, I've even seen uh, turntables now, Sean, that are vertical. Yes. So that you could actually see the colored vinyl and, and the labels go around as, w as well. Um, so... Uh, I think that has to do with, you know, trying to get back to that older a little bit uh, of the nostalgia of, gee, you know, we're not going to have frozen food, we're going to have prepared food, we're going to grind the coffee beans ourselves. So I think that's, I think that's part of it. I think that's part of that. Well, the vinyl is so interesting. I heard just today, actually, that Sony, for the first time since 1989, will resume vinyl production in 2018, which is crazy. It's, it's yeah. it seems crazy, but you know what's crazy is I'm crazy because I <laughs> when I buy records now I buy the vinyl version even though I currently don't own a turntable because in the future I plan to invest in one but the vinyl comes with all that beautiful art and and I get a digital download code with it anyways so why would I not? Well, uh, one of the things again is being somebody who's producing CDs and DVDs is that you still I think have a sonic range which is bigger than CDs. Yes. And uh, and. Uh, and I think that's a very important aspect. And I think that helped uh, really foster a lot of, you know, if you want to, uh, of, of being able to have much larger works beyond available, you know, to the public. So this is actually very interesting. And this, we're kind of going down a rabbit hole. I didn't expect to go on, but we'll go a little further right. um, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, one more thought I'm now having then is, a lot of the whole debate back and forth about vinyl or digital music or whatever, what do you think wins out? Like, which actually has the potential in reality for the best sound quality possible? And do you think that the reason that CDs have kind of fallen out of favor is because of almost production techniques by really pop, um, more pop artists, really, but they've kind of resulted in a sort of distorted loud sound that people don't identify with? And the, the record player, although it's not quite as... You mentioned dynamic range in the CD. Um, the turntable, it doesn't allow that. Does that make sense? Well, it, it is just so narrow. I mean, and, and if you one wants to listen to, uh, you know, a Mahler symphony, which can go from one extreme to the other, you're just not going to hear that on, on, on a vinyl album without a lot of noise and, and background noise. And yes. I think one of the bad um, raps that CDs has emanates back to when CDs were introduced and what a lot of record companies did was just to issue the LP masters, the vinyl masters on CD. Yeah. I remember also seeing that a lot of times, even the program notes would say, and on side two, you would see this, they didn't even take the time to change the program notes. <laughs> you know, for, you know, and you'd, you know, so you could get you know, two or three LPs on one CD, and the program notes would say, and then on this two, side A, you know, they change it. So what happened is that a lot of your vinyl masters are, they're curved, um, they're adjusted in order to get rid of the surface noise and of what can't be too loud, and that you don't want your needle to be able to jump the grooves. Mm -hmm. So that in essence, there's a certain cutoff that happens that adjusts for the deficiencies of the of the vinyl. Ah, so if it gets too when, soft, that's what causes it to jump, eh? Because it loses the, the signal. 
Well, is that what you're saying? I, well, usually if it's too loud, it, it can jump. Oh, so it goes the other way. So I'm not that you know, familiar with the, the physics of it. <laughs> no, no, because at that point, your cartridge and your needle are jumping. They're yeah, vibrating okay. and they jump out. Yeah. But also, your, your bottom floor of your surface noise that's inherent in, your, in the needle picking up means that you, you can't be that quiet either. Otherwise, you're going to hear more noise than signal. Yes. Sounds familiar. We just went through that um, when we, just before we actually started our, <laughs> the whole our conversation. Microphone thing, yeah. yeah. So what happened is that your early CDs were not the original masters. The masters that were used by a lot of the recording companies, and that was, again, all for what was expedient, what worked fast, and what also would not cost extra money. Very important aspect of this. Yeah. Was to use the vinyl masters for CD, and therefore they ended up not sounding warm, sounding tinny, and not having, because they didn't have the full spectrum sound that was available on CD. So CD was almost misused as a platform. In the beginning, in the yeah, beginning. Yeah, then, but, a lot of times, then when this was rectified, and you may recall this, and some of your listeners may recall this, all of a sudden they would talk about, gee, this was taken from the original masters. Yeah. Before the original masters were adjusted for the vinyl experience. Wow, it's so interesting. You know, and a lot of the vinyl today also means that, gee, it's easier not to, uh, to copy them. Yeah. You know, not to send audio files from it. So, in essence, you know, you're not you're you're, you're basically getting, uh, uh, if you want to say, more record sales, but it makes it harder to share, share yeah. share that share that audio. That's true. You know, but but from somebody who's done both, and I continue to do both, definitely the plus sides of, of using digital is just is just really fantastic. For a student, it's really great. If we were to, to talk about you know, Stanley's um, heritage collection, if you wanted to go back and repeat a certain passage a number of times, very easy to do. Yes, yeah. Very you know, hard to make a, Yeah, very hard right now. Yeah. Gee, well, what was that again? Let me go back. Let me, let me rewind yeah. it 15 or 20 seconds. How, how did that happen? Yeah, that's such an interesting thought. You know, my favorite way to listen to music is definitely digital. I mean, I... I plan on explore, exploring vinyl again at some point, but I mean, I, I agree. I find that the, 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 the sound of the, the needle is distracting, especially on no, low noise moments, you know, and it seems a little odd, but uh, yeah, that's such interesting insight. Thanks for, thank you for sharing all that. I wanted to get back into the heritage okay. collection, which you just brought up here for a moment. Um, just at the end here, let's talk about what your plans are. You're going to Clarinet Fest this summer down to Orlando yeah, right. with this. And Stanley's actually not only coming with you, but um, there's a, a, a performance going on. Can we talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, well, the Clarinet Fest is going on in Orlando, Florida, and it'll be from July 25th through, uh, I believe, the 31st, that Sunday. And um, Stanley is actually partaking in the uh, first... Um, opening concert, which is on that Wednesday, and I know Eddie Daniels will be there. Uh, matter of fact, um, I have a little Eddie Daniels story to tell because uh, sometimes we'd be on sessions together, and if I showed up, I, I don't double, by the way. You do and not double? I, I do not double. I've played bass clarinet, E-flat clarinet, but, uh, you know, I don't play trombone, you know, bassoon, yeah. or... You know, or <laughs> Understandably, yeah. you know, I like, can relate. But, um, and, uh, and so if I showed up, uh, uh, it was always a session where people would say, oh, this must be serious. But quite often, Eddie would end up be playing either sax or flute. And, mm. and, and so he always knew that uh, we were around. But, but, but we, 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 we've known each other from school, and I look forward to seeing him again. Eddie Daniels? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, he played last summer uh, at Clarinet Fest as well. It was just fantastic. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I heard, um, I can't remember who told me this, but that he has a solo trombone album as well. Is that, <laughs> is that true? I, I, I do not know. Yeah, I have I, to look I, into that. I, I do not know, but uh, but I also know, and I say this with great humors, I once did a, a program in Utah, very high elevation. Yeah. And and uh, I, I did the uh, one of the Brahms sonatas, which uh, was an arduous breathing task. And afterwards, I, I did one of the John Cage pieces of, of Silence. 433? 
Yes, 433. And uh, I did tease about putting it down for string quartet or, or some other instrument besides clarinet just to make it look like there was uh, some, something else on the program. But, but I, I, used that, I used that to get my breath back. A new arrangement, yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Even John Cage himself rearranged that piece, I heard. He, oh. first, he first wrote it in several movements, but he later re reworked it into one movement or something oh, like that. <laughs> so that's fantastic. Well, thank Dude. you so much for joining me on the podcast. I do hope to get the chance to come down and, and not only meet you in Orlando, but also to um, you know enjoy these performances uh, down there as well. It should be fantastic. Yeah, yeah well, and Stanley, well, thank you. And, and uh, Stanley is, is also... Uh, been very gracious in making himself available to uh, uh, to uh, be able to, to meet uh, uh, people at the clarinet fest and uh, uh, and to uh, personally uh, obviously autograph uh, any of you know, the sets that, that people may, may purchase when they're there. So that uh, that you know that way they'll they'll have quite a memento uh, you know from uh, for, from Orlando. So I've got six questions left. These are, I call them the lightning round. And uh, always I ask them if there's time. Um, there's sort of six questions that are all to be answered in less than a minute. Are you ready? Okay, it sounds like we're, 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 we're doing a, a game show here. Okay, we got it. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, I know it's a little bit strange, but people actually really like these because there's some answers in here that uh, they kind of like to get to. So um, if I were to have a peek at your music stand right now, what would yes. I find at it? What would I find on it? Oh my gosh! It's like what, what books are are in your nightstand? Okay, you will, <laughs> find, you will find um, Meyer Kupferman's uh, Three for Two. Uh, I'm actually in the middle of, the, of of doing planning a clarinet and violin album, so I'm going through repertoire for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of them, one of the pieces is, is Meyer Kupferman's. Uh, also, uh, some uh, pieces by Von Hall. Uh, Von Hall was in, in also on one of my uh, on one of my uh, Cloverfield recording CDs, uh, music for clarinet and piano, and um, and then I also have uh, and and also you use a lot of uh, Langinus for just you know basic warm up. Hmm. Very cool. If you didn't play the clarinet, which instrument yes. would you play? Well, quite often my approach to clarinet is, is so vocal and so singing that I probably would like to be a singer. I, I really do approach it that way, and I was very fortunate to uh, spend an awful lot of time doing, if you want to say, clarinet obligato work. Uh, I've uh, and, uh, performed that. Yeah. So I, I would say I would say that. So interesting because many clarinetists, um, I, I feel, identify more closely with the human voice. I think because of the characteristics of the instrument as well. Like it's a very vocal, um, expressive yeah. instrument. So we're lucky in that way. <laughs> yeah, well, the breathing in that is very important. So too. Yeah. So I'm especially interested in your answer to this one because of your work uh, producing and recording so much. But what album or piece of music changed your life irreversibly? Absolutely great question. Um, Probably two. Um, I would probably say the Brahms Quintet, the Opus 115. Um, matter of fact, I remember the recording too. It was with Leopold Vlach uh, on, on an old Westminster, I think, of, uh, recording. And um, and then the, also the, the Brahms uh, Second Piano Contrail wow. with, with, with Horowitz and, and Toscanini. Fantastic. And which... If you could go back in time, which musician, composer, or artist would you like to meet and why? Well, from a creativity point of view, Mozart. 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 I just, to think of what accomplished in, in this period of time is amazing. And also George Grufman, probably for the same reason. Yeah. You know, here are two individuals who died 
very prematurely, still in their 30s. And, and their, their work was just absolutely amazing. Yeah. No, many people have actually speculated as to what Mozart would have, you know, accomplished had he lived longer. Because as, you know, as you know, of course, most composers tend to produce their most compelling works, like Brahms, for example, later in life. And if Mozart had lived to 60 or 70, it would have been, who knows what we would have, would have gotten. So, so one last question while we're back in time, um, (laughs) what advice, (laughs) what advice would you give your 21 year old self? I would say to be very open to experience many different things, uh, to always remain curious about what other people are doing and not to be um, judgmental, but to really understand, and also to stay very familiar with other media. I always found it very, very important to understand what was going on in the art world, literary world. I often found that music sort of trailed that a little bit. You know, that there would always be, you know, that your graphic arts would always be a little bit ahead of maybe what was happening in the music field. So I think what was always very important for me was not to get locked up in in a practice room. Mm -hmm. And not realize that there is a world out there and that what is important is how your art fits in and can be consumed by, by, by society. And in today's world, that may mean doing, you know, more concerts in unusual spaces. It may be bringing the art to where the people are rather than expecting people to come to an artificial concert hall to to hear a program. Wow, that's a great response. Fantastic. One last one. Um, Okay. Along the same lines, what was the best piece of advice that you ever received and who gave it to you? I don't know if it was necessarily directly from a, from a person, but it was just so important to feel very passionate and believe in what it is because any, anything else can, can be adjusted to. But to basically be able to pursue what you love and what makes you unique is very, very important. While at the same time understanding that um, it's very important to, you know, walk a, walk a mile in a person's shoes so that they understand. Um, and to have, uh, you know, some humility about it, some self-deprecating you know, humor about it or something else like that. Uh, I once did, did a concert in, in Florida, and that was with the Ariel Ensemble, the trio, clarinet, soprano, and, and uh, piano. And uh, I think actually, I think I may have, sent along a recording of that. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and um, well, we, this, we got out of the airplane, got the rented car, and we had a flat tire. Mm. And we got to the concert for maybe, maybe, with not too much time to speak. But we did not look like we were ready to do a concert show. We were a little grimy, you know, we had car grease on us, and the whole idea was trying to explain to the audience that, gee, if we could take our intermission now, then we can come out and do the (laughs) whole concert without a break, or do you want us to play this way and we'll change an intermission? It was really like like doing, just really being able to share with the audience what we went through. Yeah. And it was something that they were able to relate to, and then we, you know, know, then we moved on from that. Uh, so what I happened? Think, I think as a performer, in, in a way, I always somehow make reactions to uh, athletes where the people who were there may never have seen us before. Um, yeah. There was always a comment about Joe DiMaggio about, you know, we always played as if a person was seeing him for the first time. Uh, and, you know, I, I once, uh, you know, we once went to get an airplane that, that, you know, where there was a connecting flight and you have to rent a car and drive to the next next station. And when you get there, you know, the audience, you know, shouldn't know that any of this has bothered you. Yeah. You know, all of, all of, all of, all of that passion for that. And, um, and and what we ended up doing in that other in that other, other situation, uh, going back to the one in Florida with that, is that we, um, we ended up taking it starting a little bit late and we sort of did a compromise. We sort of cut things a little bit short 
you know, in intermission and, and, and did that. So we, we just started the concert a little late. What an interesting story. Yeah. It's very cool. I mean, but, I, but, but I think a lot of people maybe, you know, in yeah. the audience don't understand necessarily what, what happens, and nor should they care. Yeah, yeah, I suppose, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? I want to thank you truly for coming on the podcast today. This has been one of the most compelling conversations. Very interesting stuff. And you know what? I'd, I'd, I'd Your love to... questions help. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'd love to have you back because it's, although we talked about so much interesting stuff, I really do feel like we only scratched the surface on your compelling career and the touring elements and the, the, so many different facets. So if you're down to it, I'd love to have you back in the future to, to dive deeper. And I, I'm, I'm, uh, I accept it. It's been... Uh fascinating uh and i appreciate uh, what you do for the clarinet community and uh by all means uh i accept you let me know when you are ready to do an, another one and i'd love to have a continue this conversation with you Thanks for listening to the Clarinet Podcast. For detailed show notes for today's episode and all other episodes of the show, head to www.clarinet.com. If you enjoyed today's bonus lightning round, remember that Patreon backers get access to all kinds of bonus content. To learn more, see www.clarinet.com slash Patreon, or just click on the Patreon link. Be sure to tune in next time for a conversation about the 2017 Clarinet Fest in Orlando, Florida, which I was very fortunate to have the chance to attend last week. It was an absolutely wonderful time, and if you'd like to get a preview of uh, my experience there, you can check out the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash clarinet. I've posted an over 20 minute long video about the vendor area and some of the people that I, I got a chance to meet in there. All the newest and neatest sort of inventions and clarinet uh, related finds that I that I was able to come across. So really, really great video. It's already had over a thousand views, which I'm quite surprised by actually. That seems like a, a very large number of people. But again, it was one of the most attended clarinet fests ever. So perhaps that makes sense. There was over 1500 people there, which was apparently the biggest in, in over 30 years. So anyways, one last reminder about the Stanley Drucker Heritage Collection. I think it's such a generous offer by Stanley and Jerome, but you can get a signed copy if it's before the end of day on August 18th, 2017 by heading to www.com, oh, sorry, www.digitalforce.com slash clarinet. Thank you so much for listening and thank you also to our sponsor, Diderio Woodwinds. I hope to see you next week. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, Diderio is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques so you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from Diderio Woodwinds, visit diderio.com woodwinds.